Well, if you would, please begin making your way to the very, very small book of Haggai. I mean, your best shot pretty much of finding a minor prophet book is Zechariah, just because it's so long, so many words, but just go left of there and you will find Haggai. I really appreciate the the music this morning, the, uh, the first uh, kind of gospel medley that was, that was sung at first, uh, boy, it reminded me of so much of my upbringing in, in Texas and, and just good Southern gospel type hymns, but it also um, reminded me of so many, so many Southern preachers who would come through preaching revivals and would say, Something like, I want to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that after I'm stung by a mosquito, it goes away singing, there's power in the blood. And it is so cringy, um, but nonetheless, so thank you, Gordon, what you meant for edification. You've actually really messed up my thinking this morning as we head into preaching. I'm just kidding. Um, But uh, this actually is, in a way, um, I find a little bit of relief with Haggai. Now, let me tell you why. The themes that we have in so many of the pre-exilic, and pre-exilic minor prophets would basically be these. It would be those that have led up to the captivity in Babylon, okay? Because the exile, so to speak, or in a sense, a second exodus, which leads to what we might consider the second temple, is really the release from Babylon into Jerusalem by, the Jew, by God, uh, but all the Jewish people who are remaining together again together. So it's a relief in the sense that the narrative is a little bit different. It doesn't mean that the purpose is different. It doesn't mean that uh, what we need to take from the warnings of there being sin and shame and God's eventual judgment and justice, because those, those elements are certainly here. But it really starts to get into this understanding that as we see God's hand sovereignly over his people, that as he orchestrates his plan and his promises to come about, that it is also God's means that he is both sovereign over and cares about. I mean, we would have to agree, at least we, we, we all can disagree on how God administers his sovereignty. We may have questions, but at least on our confession at, at this church, we're not in question as to whether or not God is sovereign. There are many out there who are. There are many out there who have created theologies and whole groups of theologies that would be captured under this thing called open theism, where basically in order to uh, basically deal with the way things are with also believing that God is good, they can't seem to reckon that God being good is different version of good than maybe what I consider to be good with my finite mind. And so they basically end up changing the infiniteness of God. And so here's how it goes. God knows just barely ahead of the curve what's going to happen. He's not really sovereign over it or in control of it. He's basically just a divine reactioner or reactionary to the events of the day. And he does so really nicely and really uh, kindly and sweetly, but he's not in control of those things. Otherwise, if he were, he would not let bad things happen. But this is, this is like, uh, oh man, this is, oh gosh, I have all these terrible uh, Southern preacher things. It's like putting lipstick on a pig. I mean, that whole phrase, it's just not right. But this is adorning really a basic, simple, terrible thing that in, infiltrated the church many, many years ago. It's just pragmatism. It's putting a formal theology to pragmatism that basically whatever winds up in the end, I'm not going to blame God in case something doesn't wind up the way that I think it should. But then also it means that really the way that God goes about things isn't as important as what comes about in the end. So basically that idea of whatever it takes or do whatever it takes or the end justifies the means, that would be where pragmatism comes through and where oftentimes people have adorned that pragmatism with a very complex sounding kind of theological structure. Scripture blows through that understanding and we are left to understand that he is infinite and we are finite. We are left with a transcendence, a gap, a distance between God knowing what God knows and us knowing what we know. And the humility and even the humiliation that comes as a result. Because what happens is we are then left with faith. Faith to trust that what God is doing that might seem very difficult now will produce God-glorifying, God-exalting, 
and even his own people edifying results. But God has chosen that it's the means that will produce these results in the life of his people as much and perhaps even more so than whatever the end result is. So for instance, just getting back to Jerusalem wasn't at at all the main idea. Any more than if you do go back and read the book of Nehemiah, it's not about building a wall. And Ezra, it's not just about recovering what is seen in the law, but how it gets applied and how people continue to unpack and see their sinfulness for what it is. Just because you wind up in a right state or condition, as long as the Lord has not returned, there is much for us to learn. Haggai, we know a little bit about him because of Ezra. We know a little bit about his, his name at least. It means festal or festival. It could be because what was going on at the time when he was born, that there were still some plentiful things happening uh, in Judah and in Jerusalem. Of course, these were sinful things, but it's possible that his parents named him this. Or perhaps it's a statement uh, leading to what is hopeful, which is more of a God kind of festival or a celebration that God, when he restores and sees his promises come about, especially the restoration of his people in Jerusalem. Now, it's really important to understand the time frame that this occurs because what we have is in about 520 BC is the consensus on when Haggai was written. Now, putting that in perspective, 538 B.C. is when Cyrus issued a decree that sent out the initial wave of um, Israelites or Jews back to Jerusalem. Okay, so that's an 18-year gap. So as they're released and Haggai begins to write this, what happens is over that period of time, they started in rebuilding the temple, but what they did then is shift all their efforts and began to work very robustly on their own homes and almost trying to recapture the glory that it was in the good old days, forgetting that the good old days of when their houses looked the best, they were also prone to false worship and idolatry. And so that's when Haggai comes in and Haggai comes in and and says, again, in 520 and says, you know, here's what the Lord says about your situation, your condition. You've worked on your houses, you've worked on this, but you've let my temple be undone. You've left it. Their priorities were completely out of whack, showing that even through all of the exile and all of the conquering that they still didn't get it, that this isn't about God establishing prosperity for them. It's about God setting up a people for him to dwell in the midst of so that he is glorified by all the nations. And they still weren't getting it. So historically, what we know is that the temple was then finally finished in about 516 BC. So in about a four-year period of time after Haggai comes and prophesies, they do. They switch their efforts and their resources back. But again, consider in that short period of time, they'd spent 18 years neglecting the rebuilding of the temple. Now, again, to continue with a, a larger view of the timeline here is that it's really another oh, I don't know, 25, 30 years or so that Ezra would begin to proclaim what Ezra proclaimed in the recapturing of the law. So after the temple was mostly rebuilt and it wasn't near as opulent as it had been before. Okay, it, 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 would, be, it would be tantamount to trying to rebuild a church structure after a tornado came through with all of the resources that were available. You, you know, you're not going to, to, to a lumber yard and getting fresh cut wood and that kind of thing to, to help rebuild it. They're, they're literally building it up from the rubble of having been destroyed. And in the midst of this, as Ezra comes and proclaims the word, then Nehemiah goes back and actually then establishes the walls. It's, you kind of see what happens. They go to the middle where the temple is. And instead of focusing on God, they focused on themselves. But then when God comes with Haggai and says, rebuild the temple, they do. And then outside of that comes the establishment of the word of God and the law practices. And then outside of that comes this idea that the walls would then be built. And that's where we have Nehemiah, but it's also about what it means to follow God's people, what it means about God's protecting his people with their basic security being the word, not walls. So this very centric perspective that it is God and God alone who should be the center of our community and be the center of the temple, so to speak, it does give us some hints into New Testament language and perspectives because we know that the temple has given way to the presence of Christ. And we know that Christ himself then has 
essentially said that now the church is in a sense like a diffused temple throughout the world. It's not in one central place. But God is to be the center of the place where that version of the temple resides. So here locally at Milford Bible Church, we have to make sure that what's at the center and what we're investing the most in is what is going to glorify God the most. The thus saith the Lord part. Surrounded by clear instruction of the word. And yes, it's good. We have walls. We have protection against the elements and other things. That's great. But that definitely isn't first. So you have Zerubbabel, who is basically a leader, a king of the Jews, a leader of the Jews at the time, and you have the high priest Joshua. And not to read too much into it, but isn't it interesting, Zerubbabel is actually in the line of David. Joshua, whose name, you know, not, it's not the Joshua that you've heard of. This is a thousand year older than that Joshua. But his name does mean salvation. It is the Hebrew name of Jesus. So you have this high priest whose essential name is, is Jesus, the Savior. And then you also have this king who is in the line of David, but you also have going on here a prophet in the person of Haggai. So you have kind of this, in a sense, kind of earthly view of a trinity of what it has to, what it's necessary and what God does with prophet, with priest, and with king. And I'm sure they are waiting to see if now is that time. For all I know, perhaps they were even looking at this Joshua, but we're not given any language of the inclination of the Jewish people to think, oh, is this Joshua our high priest or is he going to be, actually he is our high priest, but is he going to be the Messiah? Is he going to be the one that God brings to establish us? But still you have all of these offices divided up of prophet, priest, and king. But they're still sort of ringing that bell because this is the last time we're going to see the temple restored at this point before Christ does come. And when Christ does come, according to Hebrews chapter one, we know that he is that prophet. And we know that the annunciation of the angels, that he is that king. And certainly again, according to Hebrews chapter six and chapter seven and chapter eight and chapter nine, we see that Christ certainly is that forever perpetual high priest. Every time in the Old Testament, just as an encouragement, if you're reading through the Old Testament or if you are doing any studies in the Old Testament, anytime you see a prophet, priest, or king, you are either seeing a positive prototype as far as what Christ, the office, so look at the descriptions and all that, but we also get bad examples of these things, right? We see bad kings. And so even though it's not a a prototype, it's almost an anti-type that you get to see almost everything that Jesus is not for us. But just take those little clues because those things all help us understand the Christ of the New Testament. So in Haggai, and again, uh, back in Ezra 1 through 5, 1 through 6, we see this idea that the main theme is this, that God is going to restore the temple and he's going to bring about his pleasure in his people through that process. But it took, again, so long. And again, I think it should be noted that God did not send the prophet prior to this time. They had a long time to, re, to try to give effort. And this isn't because God is lazy or God is just trying to sit back and go, okay, I'm just going to let them get themselves in a mess. But as much as we shouldn't get into the mind of God of what he's doing here, we absolutely must understand that it is the means that God is doing something with. They started out and they were excited, but eventually because of how hard and long it is to follow God by faith, they then gave their way to sight. And that's when they started building their houses, their homes. And they went back to old ways. This is just like in the Exodus. They were in the wilderness. They were trying hard. They were trying to have faith, but in the absence of their leader, trying to remind them all the time, they built a calf made of all their goods. And they built this golden calf, which I think was probably to be used to worship God or something, but it's all they could in their weariness of faith gave way to sight and went back to the old ways trying to make heaven on earth. This is the tendency, not just of Jews. It's the tendency of humans. So the aim in this ultimately is just simply to promote obedience in the people of God. But it's how he promotes this and what he says about them and the results that I think we must take note of, which brings us to this question of really what is, what is worth investing in? Where do I need to spend my time, my money, my, my giftedness? What do I need to consider when it comes to the investment of all of these things? Basically, all the temporal things and even breath, even blood, even your strength, even your muscles, but also your spiritual gifts in this world. 
but also your resources and even your time. All of it is finite. All of it is temporal. But God calls us to invest those things in things that are eternal. And this is what we have to consider as we look at what's going on in Haggai. Now, let me go ahead and begin in the text here. In verse 1 of chapter 1, it says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? You see what he's saying? And, and just the fact that he adds this descriptor of paneled houses, we know that they were doing more than just building up uh, walls and, you know, it, these weren't lean-tos or these weren't temporal structures. They were adding a little bit of sauce to what they were doing, okay? They wanted it really nice. And he says, you're doing that and let, yet you're letting this place or the temple lie in ruin. He says, now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does not put them into a bag with holes. Oh, I'm sorry, does so to put them into a bag with holes to continue the imagery of loss and what they're investing in. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. The second time he says, consider Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take, my, take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Be declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills on the grain, at the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. I mean, God is making it clear, this is why you're struggling so much. This is why you're not getting the results that you hope to. And again, this isn't pragmatism, as in, hey, this, that didn't work, let's try a new method. God is being very clear. It's because you have forsaken me. It's because you have gone away from me. Even though I have now delivered you in a second exodus to bring you back home and establish you here as a people. And in spite of that, you have not been able to endure much at all. And in so doing, you've actually invested in the things of the world that aren't giving you any kind of satisfaction. Not at all. But in verse 12, it says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, uh, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts on the 24th day of the month in the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. So we have definite historicity. We have some declarations of this is something that actually occurred. But what you mostly have is simply this. God stirred in the hearts of those that had actually been brought to repentance. And they didn't come to repentance on their own. The word of God, as we know in the New Testament, says the word of God gives birth to faith. The word of God came to them through Haggai and God gave birth to faith for them to say, we are in remorse. We are repentant of what we have been doing, how we've been thinking. We have considered our ways, as the Lord said, consider this, consider this. And in doing so, they've realized that this really is on us. But it's still clear that it says that God was the one that stirred their hearts, but God was also with them in the rebuilding. It's actually a very beautiful picture of covenant community going on. Do what God says and there is blessing and pleasure in his presence. Why? Because when we understand that it is from God and God is for our good, then what we want and our greatest pleasure is simply God. We want what God wants. 
Now, if we weren't a people of grace, we could very much turn this at this point onto a very works-based approach to just moral spirituality. You couldn't call it Christianity. But the fact is, is that there is much more going on. For instance, in chapter 2, it says, In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? So here he is coming from the prophet, and there are people who are old enough to have seen the temple as it was before it was decimated by invasion. And he says, now look at it now. Is this even close to being the same thing? Of course, the answer would be no. He says, how do you see it now? Is it as nothing in your eyes? You yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua. So obviously there's a temptation for weakness as a result of not seeing it as it once was. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. It doesn't look like it once did, but what has God said? They find greater beauty in doing what God had commanded than the in work structure that their hands had been put to. God is continually drawing their affection to be towards Him so that what they invest in the most is what gives the most glory to God. He says, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. Yes, way back, Moses, Exodus, that whole time. My spirit remains in your midst, fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts. Yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations come, shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former glory, or the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. And then he goes on and talks about blessings that will be on the people, again, should they work according to his standard. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If, if someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with the fold, uh, the fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer, there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail. Yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that is the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, uh, pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. Every effort that they made to establish kingdom by their standards for their hopes was frustrated. And it was to be seen that it would be God that would do the blessing, not man so that man gets the credit. It doesn't mean sit back and just kind of watch things grow, but it does mean go according to the way that God says. Build up seed, build up grain, plant in this way, plant in that way. And it needs to be the right kind of produce that God says is going to bless them the most, even in the midst of drought. But whatever the case is, they had been putting their hands to it for their reasons and their ends. Even as he de then declares the greater glory of the temple that will be latter than there was even back when Solomon put it together. Every effort that they have made to do so even since that time, falls to shambles. Why? Because God is still shaking the foundations of the earth. 
This is not going to happen fully until God returns and he is the one that restores the produce of the efforts of his people in holiness. And when he restores the temple and he establishes his kingdom and it's filled with all the nations. That's when it's going to happen. It's not going to happen before then. It doesn't happen before then. He even says these works of the law that you know to do. He's reminding them, the Levitical priests, of here is how the law went. Here's how the pattern of Leviticus went. And as Ezra is about to come on the scene just about a decade later and give more description of the law, he is saying this, the law is still at work. You are my people and you are to keep covenant with this law. Despite all of the distance from the regular practices and in their heyday, from the time that basically Solomon had kids, everything had been falling apart. But God is saying that he will restore the so-called fortunes or the blessing of his people in his way. And what the people are to do is to prepare themselves in, in taking pleasure in what God takes pleasure in. And that means living by faith, living by the standard, and according to them, living by the law. Now we know that according to the New Testament, Christ has fulfilled the law perfectly for us. We are still to hold to the moral applications of the law, absolutely. But Christ has fulfilled the law in every way that man, because of the law, was exposed to be unable to do. You're like, what did you just say? The idea is this, that we cannot, that's really the essence of the law, according to Paul in Romans 6, 7, 8, is to reveal to us our complete and total inability to keep our end of the covenant. The law exposes that we cannot be his covenant people. But Christ came and is that covenant keeper and it's by faith. So until then, the law is still in play. And we also know that what Hebrews says about the law is that the law was never meant to really save them. So what we understand from Hebrews, we have to apply all the way back here. He is saying you need to keep the law and yet it's going to do them no eternal good. So what do they do? They do what God says in the moment, trusting that God will keep his promises. That's how followers of God are supposed to live. Not trying to make something happen, but to live in the way that he has said, taking pleasure in what he takes pleasure in, and then live by faith in the hope that he will absolutely keep all of his promises and he will do so perfectly. Because as much as they had hope, guess what? It didn't last very long. They got tired of working on the temple, so they worked on their homes. And then when they did rebuild the temple, guess what? Then they have Ezra come in. Yes, then they have about 20 years of focus. And Nehemiah comes in. Let's rebuild the wall. Yes. And guess what? Not 20 years after that, they start to intermingle and intermarry with false, uh, just people who are idol worshipers and from other nations. They go back to their old practices because they see those nations flourishing while they continue to struggle. God cares about how we go about what we're doing. So we have to then consider our ways as they have. We have to think about, God said it twice, consider this, consider this, consider your ways. Consider what you're doing and what you have done and what I said to do and really let that set still for just a minute on you and let it produce what it's supposed to produce, which is conviction. To consider who God is and who you are, what God has said you are called to do and what you have been doing, all that back and forth, let that happen, let it set with you and see if it doesn't produce in you a bit of conviction as to, Lord, I'm not focused I'm not focused on the things that you have called me to. And you will see every time that everything, whether it's overtly sinful or perhaps it was just sinful in spirit because of your impatience, you will find that it's always this. You've ceased to invest in what you know to be the kingdom of God. And you have been investing in the kingdoms of men. Now, some people get really big pictured and they do it through political structures. But other people, most of us are probably small pictured and do it like the children of Israel. We just work on our little kingdoms and our cars and our homes and everything else. Doesn't mean live in shambles. It's about the perspective and what gives you the greatest sense of pleasure and what is your greatest affection. What you spend your time and your money and your thought effort on will show what you love the most, no matter what comes out of your mouth. They were to consider, though, 
even their actions because what they said wasn't meeting up with what they had been spending all their money and their time and their efforts on. It was not what God had said to do. So God then says, look, you need to invest in what I have said is good, is for your good. And what is for their good is God. Because God's people will not have fellowship with God if we live in disobedience to his word. It just doesn't happen. That's the very mistake that the children of Israel made through all these previous invasions. And that's what the pre-exilic minor prophets had been saying over and over again. You're misconstruing what it means to be God's elect or God's chosen people, thinking nothing can touch you no matter what you do. But that wasn't true because he was holding them to the same standard that he held even their enemies to because he's holy. And that's not biased based on the ethnicity of any group that would say, I'm a follower. It is a standard because it is God that is the standard. They are to, in their consideration and call to repentance, they are to then to transfer and and shift their focus from the temporal to the eternal, from trusting in their own strength and their own might and their own ability and their own skill to trusting God and God's timing. Instead of planting what they think should be planted and harvesting what they think should be harvested, they are to do what God has said in his timing because God controls all the elements that causes those things to grow. It's all part of the trusting in the eternal and cease putting your hands to the temporal thinking somehow that's going to last. That's the absolute foolishness of humanity. That we think that we can put our hands to something that's going to last. The joy is that we get to pray and participate and speak words into life. I mean, this is the crazy exchange. We can speak words that really just kind of dissipate as soon as acoustics die down and any kind of volume of air or the acoustics of a wall. As soon as those words kind of dissipate, it's so temporal. It's, it's so fleeting. And yet he says that when we speak his truth, it actually can bring about resurrection. It can bring about eternal life. I'm not talking about the fountain of youth or or Indiana Jones going to look for something or anything like that. We're talking about an actual eternal life when you drink of the word of God. What an exchange of the temporal for the eternal. And our foolishness, even as Christians, is to think if we somehow can put our hands to this and really form it, I don't care how many Christian fish or crosses you slap on it, if you are doing it in your way, in your strength, I promise you the end goal is for your glory. Every single time. And we have got to back up and say and consider, what am I really spending my time on? What am I spending my money on? What am I really investing in? Is it really what God has put me here for? Or are you spinning the wheels? And this isn't about, there's no kind of a, um, like backhanded thing coming in at the end of, okay, now we're going to, we, we've got some expansion. We're going to do, are you going to invest in the temple? In the, <laughs> that's, not, that's not coming. There, there's no expansion um, or anything that we're raising money for here at the church. Because in the New Testament, the temple has been diffused from, been centralized in Christ, but then been diffused to the church. And that church is a people. He calls them, from the end of chapter one to him speaking of the coming glory of his temple and speaking of, are you seeing it? Do you see what you've done? Do you see you need to be strong? You need to be doing the right things for the right reasons because God has a plan. God is going to bring about a prosperity and a beauty to this that causes the former temple, the one they really think about in their minds, the one with Solomon, it's gonna pale in comparison. But they're just building up the temple from just the rubble. It's about trusting that God's ways will lead to God's ends. That's the only way God gets glory, truly. Otherwise, honestly, if you persist the way God, and he will be glorified, don't get me wrong. The way God gets glory is showing justice that even if you had a noble end in mind, if you did it in a God forbidden way, he will not say, you know what, it's okay. I know your heart was good. No more than a person who's, generally a nice person goes to heaven just based on the merits of them being a decently, you know, motivated person. It comes to proclamation and profession of Christ alone as Savior and a confession of repentance that I am a sinner in need of this Savior. And if he doesn't save me, no one can. It's not by good intentions 
or good effort. It's also seen in whether or not you are really a remnant, so to speak, if your desire is to not just do what God says, but do it the way God says to do it. So he says, invest in the people, invest in each other, invest in building what I'm going to be building, which what he's really doing here, guys, it's less about building this temple and it's more about building the people to understand the temple that's to come, who is Christ. We know in John 2, 19 through 22, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up again in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Of course, the scripture being the Old Testament for them. And Christ saying that he has become this embodiment of the presence of God, because he is God. But then it goes on. In Acts 5, 42, it says, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. For those still looking for God's presence, this becomes an investment in evangelism, in gospel sharing. But I love this phrase of in the temple, but also house to house. There's not many places in Scripture you're going to find an equity of verbiage related to people's homes and the temple. And what I mean by that is the temple has now, now that Christ has ascended and left the scene, has now been put into the people of God, his dwelling place in this world. Temple has always been, in a sense, a temporal structure for the eternal presence of God to be seen. But then it was in Christ because he came, but now it's in the people who are now the redeemed, the ones who don't have to go through a holy of holies via a priest because Christ has done that for them already. So what's interesting is whether the people, and this is the way I read this, as the early church, they were gathered in the temple and sometimes in the, in the court of the Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles alike, as they would gather there because it was a spot for the people of God to be together, but also house to house. The idea here is that the temple now is mobile. It's been diffused in the lives of a people collective, uh, collected in a, in a particular region so that they can exalt God together in the midst of people who look upon them and do not understand. And they went in the temple, house to house, wherever. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. So you are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Are our bodies eternal? I mean, not in the sense of like how they're built now. Will he restore us and give us new bodies? Yes. But what this definitely blows up is you can't just simply say, I'm going to invest in the eternal I'm going to invest in the things that are actually of God, but I'm just going to let all these temporal things go to waste. There were a lot of people in in Corinth that were actually doing this very thing. They were the Stoics. They were the ones that said, if you don't invest in spiritual things, everything else should go. In fact, you show your love by the Spirit by actually letting your body go, letting your house go, just letting, just show you don't care. That's not what he's saying. So you don't get to say that because you understand that it is a Structure, something that God is using temporally to show his eternal magnificence and glory in the world. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 says, So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Still using building structure, but those structures and and those metaphors, those analogies are meant to go to a very spiritualized realization of it's Christ that is the chief cornerstone. Every other brick has been built by the proclamation of the prophets, what they have said from the Word of God, how Christ is the fulfillment of all of God's law and covenants. That's what you're building so that you, and he's not saying structure, he says you people are being built together to be the temple of God. That means then that if you're going to invest like God has called us to in the things that are eternal, then you need to invest in those that are basically considered God's temple. And that's the church. That's the people of God. There needs to be a deferment that we actually are building one another up spiritually to endure. How horrible is it? 
that in our day and age, we have so many churches now that have become so much about temporal things that they gather supposedly as the eternal people of God, but all their attention and investment is given towards temporal structures and systems. That is literal profanity. You are not to trust the preacher that preaches mostly about the things of this world and the kingdoms of men. You need Haggai's in your life to remind you, don't invest in the things of trying to make heaven on earth for yourself. For, pay attention to it, just like your body. Your house needs to be in, doesn't need to be in disrepair. It does reflect, especially to the lost world, of things that are deeper and more real. But you will know. You will know when you look at your checkbook. You will know when you look at your time and your calendar and your to-do list. You will know whether or not your primary investment is in the things of God. If you wonder, why am I never satisfied in this or in that? Why am I always coming to the end of myself? It's because you don't want to stop and consider what you're really doing, be convicted by it and realize you're not investing where you should. Is your whole life geared just towards uh, retirement? I'm pretty sure we have some people in the room that are retired that can remind you that retirement is not all that's, all it's supposed to be. All the dreams that you had, my own father-in-law invested thousands and thousands in wonderful tools. I got a lot of those, thankful, great, can't use most of them. But it was to work on a house that he was never able to really put his hands on because immediate, virtually immediately within retirement from Lockheed Martin General Dynamics back in the day, Parkinson's. And in about nine short years, it took him. So many people have their plans they have their plans of what's eventually going to be heaven for them. Retirement. I can live on this. I can live on that. You have no guarantee you're going to live on anything. We just don't. That's not to scare you. That's to say that is the very mentality that God is coming against here is to think that somehow there's a promised land we're going to reach while here. And our contentment and our joy and actually our battle against discontentment is only going to be successfully lived out when we lift up our heads and realize God has put me here for eternal reasons. If you're not using your spiritual gifts among the people of God, you're not going to feel fulfilled as a Christian. If you're not using your resources, your time, your efforts for other things that would build up the people of God and proclaim the gospel to the lost world, I promise you, no matter what you're doing, you're just not going to be satisfied because you're investing a purpose in it that is not consistent for the person who is part of God's people. Most of us throughout time are living, not going to see the end hope. We'll, we'll die and we'll be in his presence, but then there will still be a future time, so to speak, where God will bring all of that about. But we live in faith that it will come about. This is our God, we are his people. When we learn to take pleasure in who God is above everything else, then we start to better trust God's means, God's ways. We trust that it's not men, it's not bank accounts, it's not anything else that we trust in to do God's bidding. God uses those things, but that's not what we trust in. He wants to renew our faithfulness to him. I can say this, and I've I've said it many times that if you have impure motives or means, no matter how pure you think the results are, it's poison. Rest in God's ways. Don't say, well, God's ways just don't work anymore. How in the world does God, do God's ways not work to accomplish God's ends? Well, we presume what we think God's ends are. And think of the hubris. And the pride of saying, oh, well, I know what God wants. Oh, you wouldn't say it out loud with your mouth. But that's what we're saying in effect when we say, in order to bring about what I think would please God the most, I might have to bend a few rules. I'm not going to go about it with faith. Guys, he has called us to stop and consider. Consider our money, consider our time, consider our thoughts. Take time at some point to consider who you are, who God is, and how you're investing your life. And then, yes, Scripture calls us to count that cost. To count the cost. What are we doing with it? What's it going to cost me? 
It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have to give up your job or your business. It doesn't necessarily mean that at all. But you better lay it before the Lord because God has kind of proven himself through the minor prophets that he is willing to go to great lengths to show his jealous love for his people by removing all of the world from them. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm saying at least say, God, use this for your glory. And if you realize that he can't, then whatever fears you had of God taking something away will simply become a way for you to show your love and your faith by saying, I can't do that in this job. My job is requiring me to do things that I know are against God's laws for me. Or I can't do this because I've just gotten in too deep. It literally is kind of like cutting off the right hand or the arm or plucking out the eye. It's just become too close to sin in my life. I need to move on. I had this happen with a dear friend. One of my best friends who was in the semiconductor industry, so basically microchips for computers. Yeah, I mean, you talk about something that took off in the 90s especially. And if you touched it, you were doing great money-wise. But in the course of it, uh, a girl that was an intern of his became a superior of his, like in about a five or 10 year period of time. But he told me he was really struggling with, he was, it wasn't jealousy actually, he was really attracted to her. He never said anything, never acted on it. That's the kind of relationship we had. It was like the pre, 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 I feel like I might send sometime kind of relationship that we had. And we were never afraid of being able to say to each other, do you think you need to resign? I mean, knowing that he would ask that of me if I were in a situation and I would ask that of him, the fact is the Lord actually took care of it. Actually, he was let go and found another great job. So God was very merciful. But guys, everything should be on the block or the altar and say, Lord, you've given me this. If this can't be used for your glory, then please remove it from my hands and place me elsewhere and trust him. Trust him. Count the cost. But then as you've considered and you've counted, then simply change. Change. But how do you do that? You do that in the simplest of ways. And I think this is the blessing of God in the local church. We see each other. We can't see the Spirit. We can't see the Son. We can't see the Father. But we can see each other. He's blessed us because of our weak faith that we're able to see others who have been transformed by Christ. Start with that. Start with the church and ask yourself, am I investing resources, my gifts, and my time like I should be? Again, this isn't some play uh, or to tug on anything to give you guilt or whatever or to increase the tithe or what God's blessing us. We're, we're fine right now. Okay, and for the finance committee, give more. But um, I love them all. But no, truly, it's, it's about looking at what's right in front of you. You don't have to go and try to figure out, oh, I need to figure out this really new cool initiative that's going to make me feel really great with all these other millionaires. And I'm going to give, not that that's the case for most of us, I'm just saying, that, that we think of something really big we can be a part of. No, start with your local church, not some other ministry. That is where the glory of God is most readily seen. Guys, that is the temple. We are a temple of the Lord. Start in the temple. Just start putting your emphasis back there with your time, your effort, your gifts. Yes, even your resources and your finances. But start there and say, Lord, here I am. Use me as you see fit. And see if he doesn't start to change where your affections fall and how easy it is either to let go of something that you're fearful he might call or simply that he redeems it and he gives you great joy and he can use it for his pleasure and his good. And all you can do is not be thankful for the new success. You're thankful for the perspective that you know without a doubt you can say, God is glorified right here, right now. I could not be more content. May that be for his glory. And guys, I do have to say this. Perhaps those of you who are struggling with contentment, if, you're, if you claim to be a Christian, I believe it's because there are some investment things that are off. But perhaps you don't know if you're a Christian. Your discontentment could be that you are constantly trying to find heaven on earth and you can't. And just coming to church is just going to be another way of trying to do that. Perhaps you're here because you realize that he is actually showing you that he is calling you to be a citizen of his kingdom and to be part of something that is nothing that you could knock on the door enough to get in on. He's calling you. He's drawing you. He's raising you from the dead and he's saying, trust me. I hope that's the case. Let's pray. God, I do pray that you would help us today. I pray that you'd help us with
this book to understand that uh, it seems so hopeful that they would be released from captivity and go to their homeland and to be able to restore a, a temple and, and uh, look forward to their fortunes so-called being restored. And yet none of it was working out quite the way that they thought. Nothing looked the way that they imagined it would look. Their expectations were being thwarted. But God, it's a reminder that that's the, that's the human experience for so many of us. It could be a time, a time frame, what we imagined life would be like in college or out of college or in marriage or later in marriage with, you know, empty nested or having grandkids or in retirement. We have constant opportunities to be frustrated, to have our expectations blown out of the water. God, so often it is simply because we have thought wrongly about all of these stages And God, we have ceased to invest in the eternal. So Lord, I pray that you'd bring all of us to just a humble submission that says, Lord, use us, send us, even take of us and even give to us any and everything that would give you the greatest glory. If that's suffering, even sickness and illness, we trust your administration. If it's healing and it's Success, we trust the way that it comes about so that everything is leveraged for your good. But Lord, whatever the case, may you be glorified in us. May we be the people that you have called us to be until kingdom come and help us to look in hope and not grow weary of living by faith and to be tempted with things of sight. So we pray all this in the name of Christ and ask for your help. Amen.